Hey, we are live. Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for tuning in to another uh, In Conversation with interview on my channel. And on this fine Friday night, it's raining here, um, which is actually fantastic for this kind of book with this really beautiful dark atmosphere with the marshes. And oh, it's like perfect weather for me personally. I don't know what it's like down there, Eden. Is it, is it pretty nice? It is super windy, um, mm -hmm. which is also good for the atmosphere of this book. Yeah. So it but feels yeah. like there's a storm coming, but it's not quite oh. here yet. Oh, well, I'm fortunately not because I feel like that might have, you know, affected our connection. But no, yeah. It's, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's definitely it can come later. It's fine. But yeah, the atmosphere is perfect because, yes, I am chatting with Eden Royce. Um, Eden, thank you so much for joining me on my channel. Like I've just been in love with Root Magic since I read it earlier this year. And I'm just like, I'm just I'm just so lucky to have you on here. So thank you so much for being here. It is my absolute pleasure, and thank you so much for all the love you've shown to Root Magic. I am oh incredibly God. appreciative. Oh, you know when you just like find that book that just, oh, it just it makes you escape the world, and you just fall in love with the the prose and the the setting, all of it, the characters. Oh my gosh, there's so much that we need to unpack today. But I do want to let everyone know this will be a spoiler-free interview on root magic which i have right here this will be a spoiler free discussion so i hope nobody um who hasn't yet read it yet and um, will feel that we will spoil anything there is so much that happens in this as well that i don't want to spoil um so don't worry that's not going to happen uh but i do want you guys to give it a read so i do have links in the description box to buy it um and these are mainly like american links so what i'm doing is um eden was so kind enough to send uh two copies two signed first edition copies of the book and this is for UK residents because it is hard to get hold of in the UK so if anybody who doesn't have a copy in the UK wants to win a signed first edition of Root Magic leave the Union Jack emoji so I know that you're from the UK and as well as a social media link so I know how to DM you you know ask if, if you're okay with sending your address of course because i need to send it out to them but um yeah so that again Eden, thank you so much for doing that as well like, that was so kind and generous of you um so yeah um before we start as well Eden, i do this really random icebreaker round where i ask the most randomest of questions okay. so i i haven't prepared you at all for these but i feel like they're good yeah. questions. i feel like it's okay it's okay, okay. um <laughs> but if anybody else in the live chat has any questions then do let us know i'm sure Eden will be more than happy to answer them too um and just some comments as well very curious just by the title i mean the title we'll talk about this here but i actually do want to know like where the title came from and everything um just started root magic today so can't wait for this and getting more excited for it. as you should be it is extremely it's amazing. So yes, I hope you guys will love it. I'll pop this back. Um, anyway, the first random question, Eden, I hope you like it. <laughs> what is something that you love to do that isn't anything to do with writing, with books, anything like that? Is there something that you have, like maybe a side hobby that you love to do? Anything that we don't know about? Um, I don't know if you know this or not, but I love roller skating. Oh. I have been an avid roller skater since I was probably about seven years old. Oh. And it is just one of my favorite things to do. Um, it's nostalgic, it's exercise, it's sort of, you know, wind in the hair, rush of adrenaline kind of thing um, that I have loved for years. So I still roller skate. Nice. And you're good at it as well. Like you can. You yes, know, I can do yeah. the little spin out and, you know, <laughs> go backwards and do all that other sort of stuff. Um, I've tried to teach a few friends that haven't um, really had much experience with roller skating, but with varying levels of success. Nice. Nice. So you could probably enter some competitions then if you wanted to. And you probably beat everyone. That would be nice. I, <laughs> I thought about trying out for roller derby and I thought, no, Ooh. I couldn't injure my hands. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah no not your money makers you can't ruin no, those can't. <laughs> uh, well I'm, oh, I'm loving seeing everyone um putting their handles in the chat as well that's awesome uh oh also so excited to read root magic for whatever a thon next month there's a readathon next month um called whatever you want a thon so i'm uh the leader of the middle grade monarchs 
And Root Magic is one that I will be recommending everyone to read for whatever a thon. So, guys, get those points we need to win. Um, so, yeah, also, Sarah just bought a copy today. Very excited to read it. I'm so excited for you to read it too, Sarah. Um, anyway, my next question is this one might require a little bit more thinking, actually. Okay. Pretend that all creatures in myth and folklore were real. Is there a particular creature? that you would not want to face the most? Like, is there any that really terrifies you that if it was real, you would avoid, like, like as much as you could? Ooh, that's an amazing question that I have never been asked. Um, Yay! I do need a... <laughs> I did it! I, did it. <laughs> I, I asked a question. In this book, really. <laughs> and that is not one of them. Um, I think um, if I had to choose one of them because to be honest there are a lot that i wouldn't want to meet just full stop yeah you know, period yeah. um i think one of the things that um i'm not going to necessarily think this is folklore necessarily but it is uh it's one of my favorite movies um which is john carpenter's the thing oh so yeah. um definitely not the whole shape-shifting, taking on the guise of someone that I'm familiar with, you know, sort of revealing itself to be this hybrid mishmash of everything that it's ever consumed would not want to meet that in real life. Oh, no, that's just terrifying, just the thought of it, to be honest. I would Absolutely. also not like to meet that either. And actually, <laughs> um, uh, for me, uh, I would say, like, Haynes, like, anything, like, ghost-related, I think would be one that I would, just because with ghosts, you, they're so unpredictable, and you can't really, like, see them half the time, you don't know what that they're there, and sometimes it's fear of the unknown that really gets under my skin, so mm. that, or, like, maybe, like, a banshee, like, the screaming and the blood and all of that, that would, that would, uh, terrify me, and That's I hate really loud terrifying. noises, too. Yeah, right? And all that's human. Like, just be quiet. Like, I'm trying to read or something, you know? It's not... <laughs> or I'm trying to film, you know? Just They're, they're just too loud. They're too loud. Uh, and actually, it's really funny that you mentioned a, a movie that you enjoy, because my next question was going to be, if I asked you what would be the greatest movie of all time, what would you say? And you did say that you like The Thing, but would you say that's the greatest movie um, of all time that you've ever watched? Oh gosh, I, I think I have several greatest movies because mm. I have a, my favorite movie, movie horror, and mm. then I have my favorite, I will watch this movie anytime it comes on, anytime I find it, whatever. Mm. And then there's uh, movies that just sort of feel like home to me. Mm. Um, so I will mention the movie that feels like home to me is Eve's Bayou. Um, which is an amazing Southern Gothic movie that I absolutely love. Um, it has uh, Samuel L. Jackson in one of his roles that I don't think that he says any curse words in. Oh, Shocking really? Oh, wow. Yes, I don't recall. He might say one, but um, I don't really remember any of that happening. Um, and then just the, I don't usually like the term guilty pleasure because if it's something that makes you happy, I think you should indulge in it regardless. Um, but I'm going to use it for this purpose. So one of my guilty pleasure films uh, is also Roadhouse. Ooh, interesting. Interesting I because them. I haven't seen them. So I'm shocking. I'm shocked. I'm sorry, Eden. My homework now is going to be to watch them, Eve's Bayou as well. Like that sounds like right up my street. I love horror yeah. so much. And I haven't seen it. Like that's just Eve's uh, Bayou, uh, it's creepy, it's spooky, but it also I think is one of the few films that I've seen that portrays um certain hoodoo very well. Ah. Um, because so many movies don't portray it well. Um, but I think that movie does a very good job. And uh, Roadhouse just, you know, if action, movie, just watch it. Gotta love it. I Gotta love watch it. it. I, I, I expect to hear a review from you once you do. <laughs> I will DM you. I will be like, look, I've just watched it. Like, I will DM. I'll oh, DM you. Do. 
I'll DM you quotes. I'll be like, some yeah, Samuel L. Jackson did not swear at all. Like, what is going on? This is <laughs> like, what's going on? Me. What kind of character is this for him? But <laughs> yeah. it works. It just all, all of it just works. It all works. Oh, I can't wait now. I'm definitely looking forward to that. I need, I need movies to watch. I'm terrible at watching them. Um, I, it takes me a while to watch uh, TV shows as well. And there's nothing that I can. Have, has there been any TV shows that you've binged lately, or that you've like really love that you've enjoyed? Um, I tend to, if I'm super busy with work or stressed about a deadline, I tend to rewatch shows that I already know that I like, mm. um, or I'll watch something that's super low investment, like a cooking competition show or something like that, yeah. where, you know, it's sort of enjoyable to surfacely watch. And mm. I know that I'm not deeply emotionally involved in it because I don't have the energy for that. Um, <laughs> fair. <laughs> it happens. Yeah, it happens. no, that's fair. Or I'll just sometimes watch, rewatch a show that I've seen many times, like reruns of the Golden Girls. I have those on mm. DVD. So when I just want to lightweight watch to forget everything else for the day. Nice. Nice. That's a uh, amazing answer. Also, um, Jess is here. Jess runs the Brown Girl Boot Club, and Root Magic is the current boot club pick um, for the the Brown Girl Boot Club, which is incredible. And uh, it it timed out so well as well because Jess announced it, and I was like, "Oh my god, Jess! Guess who I'm interviewing in May?" And we, we both freaked out. So thank you so much for coming along, Jessica. I really appreciate it. Um, also, like some more love for Root Magic too absolutely love it um as you should as you should and also oh, so this much. is the book mummy and i will read for our next bedtime story alice age seven Yay. oh hope you love it alice and mummy. yeah yeah and yeah i feel like it's important that the parents also love the books and this is a kind of book that i feel like a lot of parents would um anyway i uh, some more like uplifting stuff um can you tell me a moment from the past year that has really made you smile I know it's been like a bit of a, a rough year for everyone, but has there been a particular moment from the past year that's really put a smile on your face? Oh gosh, um, I've had um, several positive moments with the book coming to fruition, with this being my debut, the first novel I've ever written. Um, so I've had some positive um, experiences with that. And I think one of the biggest things is, um, and we can, talk more about this later if you want to. Um, during the edits for the book, I had lots and lots of edits. And there was one part where I got some feedback where they wanted to change some of the language in the, in the book. And I was concerned about that because I feel like a huge part of Root Magic is the language and how it's used. And it's part of that is sort of a commentary on how different people use language and how people use it as this barrier to others sometimes. So I worried about, well, how am I going to write the book that I want to write and remove this? I'm, I'm not sure if I can. Um, but thankfully, my editor um, on his own went away and did some research on Oligichi culture and language. And without my having to address anything, he came back to me and said, you know, I've done some legwork and homework on my own. So um, I see what you're trying to say. So we want this book to be what you want the book to be. So yeah. we will use the language that you want to use. And I think that was one of the biggest weights lifted off my shoulders uh, in the process in the past year. And that was definitely a smile in a, whew, thank goodness for that, uh, sort of right. way. Yeah, I feel because you must have felt, especially with it being your debut middle grade book, that kind of you wanted this to be the most authentic version of the story that gets published. Um, so for anybody to try and change any of the language or what you wanted to portray in your book would have been, well, rather devastating because once it's out there, once it's published, it wouldn't have been what you 100% wanted to be out there. So yeah, I can imagine the the utmost relief that you had. But yeah, when we yeah we can absolutely talk more about 
um, the, the publishing process of the book because actually I do want to get into uh, more questions about you as an author before we talk more about Root Magic. Sure. Um, and also this incredible comment too, our fifth grade class is reading your book. We love your book and have a question. Will there be a sequel? I mean, I was going to save like that kind of question to the last, but why not start off with, will there be more like Root Magic? I would love for there to be. If the publisher tells me, hey, we would love a follow-up, I am ready to write a follow-up. Um, so the moment they the moment they say they would want it and are interested in publishing it, absolutely, I would love to write a sequel. Mm. Oh, that's oh, that's made me so happy. So did you hear that, guys? We all need to start atting the publisher. We need to start <laughs> hyping room magic up. We need to get on this. We need to make this happen. That's what I'm hearing. Uh, so. Um, I, so, well, speaking about, like, because um, Jessica's also, yeah, many horror stories about publishing. Um, for you as an author, um, how did your writing journey begin? Because, I mean, this is your debut middle grade, but you have been writing beforehand as well, haven't you? Like, the words, like, short stories. So what was your journey like? Um, this is my first novel, full mm -hmm. stop. And it's my also my first middle grade piece of work. Which, honestly, um, it doesn't read like that at all. It reads like you're, like... It's so experienced. Like this feels like your tenth or eleventh or something. Like oh, this just—it doesn't read like a debut at all. It was um, it was nerve wracking to have not only a debut novel but also a new work in an age group that I'd never written in before. So there was a lot of almost nail biting moments of have I gotten the voices right? Do they sound like kids? You know, can you tell the difference in voices and all of that? So. I'm so glad to know that it came out well and it came out the way that I wanted and it doesn't feel like a debut. Um, most of my other writing has been short stories and that was one of my challenges with Root Magic. Um, most of what I'd written before was probably maximum 5,000 words, 6,000 words maybe. And Root Magic is probably close to 70,000 words. Wow. So I thought, how in the world am I going to move from feeling like I've written a contained story in five to 6,000 words and trying to tell a story with multiple subplots and multiple things happening and get it up to 50, 60, 70,000 words. Um, so that was, that was a challenge in and of itself. And I ended up breaking my ideas down into individual short stories. <laughs> Right. And I wrote them as individual short stories. And then I ended up thinking, well, from what I'm looking at, publishers aren't clamoring for short story collections for this age group. So I went back and ended up writing bits to connect all the short stories so that they weren't sort of introduce the problem, resolve the problem in each chapter. So I ended up moving lots of things around and writing connected material and you know, lots of shifting and editing. Um, but before that, it was short stories. And um, I had trouble getting my short stories published a lot of times. Um, so I ended up self-publishing a short story collection. And I sort of compiled these short stories that I'd gotten numerous rejections for over the years and put them in a collection and wrote an intro to them and just sort of put it up as a self-published book. And I went around asking people if they were interested in having a copy and reviewing it. And that's sort of how I got started. I had a few short stories published in what was probably a little more than a vanity press early, early in my career. Um, they're now defunct. So um, all of those stories were just still sitting on my hard drive. And I thought, well, I'll pick, pick out the ones that I still feel are fairly strong, good stories, and I'll try submitting them. And then when I got those rejections, I thought, okay, I'm apparently going to have to make my own space uh, in the publishing world here. And that's where my first short story collection, Spook Light Southern Gothic Horror, came out. Oh my gosh. Well, I mean, it sounds like you didn't have an easy time of it at all. Um, the entire way of trying to get to uh this point of releasing root magic as well but also that experience from 
writing so many short stories must have like it, it's evident um just through your debut middle grade how much that has helped and i feel like i mean i haven't read the um short horror stories um yet but uh i feel like a lot of that must have influenced like room magic due to uh the the atmosphere of, of the book and how dark it can be um also were there any kind of books or stories or anything that you read as a child or anything that influenced you as a writer or even as a reader i have i've read so many things um a lot of the things that i read when i was younger some of it was appropriate for my age group but a lot of it wasn't appropriate for my age group <laughs> because um my mom taught school and she would sometimes get home a little bit after I did. And, you know, my grandmother would be in the kitchen cooking dinner or doing something. And I would go and pull a book off of my mom's bookshelf. Sometimes it would be a book that she got when she was in high school or college, because I found a box of those in the attic. Um, so I read Poe and I read uh, The Picture of Dorian Gray. Mm -hmm. And um, I read Jane Eyre and all of these things that were sort of associated with high school classics that were things that you should read um, that were probably not appropriate for me at the time. Um, but I also read things that were my age group because my mom would take me to the library a lot. Um, but she also had things like um, poetry collections and things like that, that I would just sort of devour and I would just read absolutely everything that I possibly could. Um, that was in front I, of you, yeah. Yeah, absolutely everything that was sort of there and I just I just loved the new experiences of it and sort of losing myself in a story. Uh, and the fact that you read Jane Eyre at a young age though I'm so impressed like <laughs> I read that for uni and I struggled I'm like I was I, I still feel like I'm probably I wouldn't be able to understand it or anything now like I'm terrible at classics but I do enjoy them but I'm terrible with them uh, but I'm impressed <laughs> um, what do, what does your writing process look like and did like is your writing process different from writing short stories to um, when you wrote, wrote Root Magic? Or um, is there not like too much difference? Like, do you have a set routine? Do you do it in the morning? Do you do it at night? Do you have to have a beverage with you? My writing process is somewhat chaotic. <laughs> um, <laughs> I like that. <laughs> I usually have, I usually have some sort of notebook where I that I have near almost all the time because whenever an idea strikes me, I try to jot it down because a lot of times, 10 minutes later, I won't remember what it was and I'll go, that was the best idea that I'd ever had. And now I can't remember what it is. So I have this notebook just filled with notes and ideas and bits of dialogue and, and bits of quotes that sort of inspire me. And I try to keep that handy. Um, and I didn't have until recently a schedule because I just would sort of be led by how I felt, you know, oh, right now I, I wanna write for a while. And recently I found a group of UK authors that we get on Zoom uh, at eight in the morning, Monday through Friday, and write for an hour or two, uh, depending on who has time or whatever. Um, but before I started writing full time, all of my writing had to be done after work. I would come home, put dinner in the oven, and after I had dinner, it would be sit at the table with the computer and write until it was almost bedtime. Didn't have much time for TV shows then. And it doesn't sound like it. Well, I'm glad you sacrificed the TV shows for writing. Um, so it, 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 Autumn's right. We do love a chaotic writing process. Um, oh, and look, baby Austin's here. Hi, baby. Hi. <laughs> um, <laughs> But uh, uh, Victoria can't say reading the book right now, loving it. Like, honestly, like, you will love it. We're not going to spoil anything. So if you want to stay, you absolutely can. Don't worry. Um, but yeah, I'm a, I love the fact that you actually do a Zoom at 8 o'clock in the morning. So that means you'd have to get up well before 8 o'clock for, do you drink coffee or anything? Like, do you have to have a coffee morning? I have morning? to have coffee. Um, yeah. First thing, well, I get up, feed the cats because, oh. you know, that's obviously yeah, the priority. I can't do anything else without that and yeah. make coffee um and basically just i have to do that in order to sort of get my brain going but right. these are writers that i'm super comfortable with so there's no need to worry about how i actually look on camera <laughs> so that part That's i don't funny. have to do 
as long as That's there's, good. you know, the idea notebook and a cup of yeah. coffee, I'm usually fine. Oh my gosh, it sounds awesome, actually. Uh, and great to have that support too, the inspiration, the motivation, just to like, um, especially when you face maybe a blank page, I guess that's probably like one of the most intimidating parts of writing is there's a blank page, you need the kind of push to, you know, um, see it through, I guess. So that's awesome, actually. Um, so I, I'd lo absolutely love to talk about publishing then and getting Root Magic published and the challenges you face. You got to publish because you mentioned it before. It was not an easy process. So what were some of the challenges that you had to experience um, going from, you know, self-publishing yourself to finding uh, somebody who would publish Root Magic? Well, I started out, um, as I mentioned, I had some stories self-published. I worked with some small presses for some of my work. And I thought, well, you know, the next step that I should sort of try to go for uh, is traditional publishing, because it was really one of the only things I hadn't made an effort to try, um, because it seems like a very uh, big thing. You know, it feels like a big, challenging thing. And I thought, well, as much trouble as I had with getting short stories published, oh my gosh, traditional publishing for a full-length novel, whoa. Well, one of the things I think um, made me sort of decide to do that is, you know, looking at a lot of the authors who are willing to share their own stories, you know, on social media, and it's motivating. And you think, okay, well, I should be able to do this. People do this all the time. Um, surely I should be able to rise to this challenge. And I wrote the, the book, as I mentioned to you, short stories first and connecting things. And I did one of those online pitch, Twitter pitch, right. agent pitch things. Um, and I got some likes, but once I sent my full manuscript, they were just like, mm, nah. So I didn't really, I didn't get any traction there. And I joined Justina Ireland's Writing in the Margins internship program. Love her. And she ended up choosing my book and pairing me with a mentor um, who is uh, the wonderful Sandra Mitchell. And we went over my book and she made suggestions and I took on board some of those suggestions and made changes. And we worked on the book for um, several weeks during the summer. And at the end of the process, the end of the internship, she said, I think you're ready to query. And I queried several places and um, I ended up getting agent representation. I had two people to choose from and I chose one of them and she had some suggestions. So um, some of those I took on board and some of those changes I made. And so she sent the book out once we were ready to go on submission to probably 16 places. And I got one place that said, yes, we would like this book. So even though there are people that have multiple offers and all that, Root Magic got one offer and I was super happy um, and delighted. And I got on a call with the publisher and we had this uh, talk about their vision for the book and my vision for the book. And we came to a happy medium. And all I can say to everybody out there that's trying to get a book who's had setbacks or rejections, it does only take one place to say yes. Oh, that's so inspiring. Yeah, and I, I mean, I would have loved if like, cause I feel like anybody who passed up on this book must be kicking themselves now. They've got to be. <laughs> Cause it's just, oh, like it's, it's just like one of the best middle grade books I've read. So like, uh, yeah, it's just, I mean, to me, like, I, I, I feel a bit like, uh, disheartened for you because I felt like the, the passed up on one of the best opportunities that I had. Um, so it, yeah, it was a fantastic thing that, that one did say yes. And that's incredible. Like, how did you celebrate when that happened? Were, were you like jumping up and down? Were you like screaming down the phone or, or what? I, well, my agent called. Um, and it was the first and I think the only time she's ever called me on the phone. And I thought, oh, well, I wonder what this is about. Because I didn't know at the time that traditionally that information is sent to you, is given to you over the phone instead of in an email. 
So um, she called me and said, hey, we have someone that wants to make an offer on your book. And I think I sort of, I was stunned. And I think I sort of managed to uh, mumble up, oh, really? <laughs> and um, she said, yeah, we, we want to get on a call and we want to talk about it and we'll send you some information and all of this jazz. And I think I hung up the phone and um, my husband was in the room with me and he said, well, what happened? And I said, I think I just got a book offer. So it was more of this whole sort of stunned response yeah. Um, yeah, than yeah. anything else. And because I've had so many things happen to me in my publishing life, um, including um, one particular time, I had a short story that was accepted to this anthology and before it went to print, um, the publisher decided that my story didn't fit with the others and basically kicked it out of the anthology. So it didn't actually get published. So I've learned to sort of reserve my celebration until I actually get the document to sign. Fair, fair. I, yeah, definitely a kind of like a pinch me kind of moment like, yeah this is a bit like dreamlike i'll wait until like it happens before yeah i totally get that um how you mentioned before about like how um there were going to be like changes that you didn't want to make like how did you hold your nerve um when these kind of changes were presented to you because can imagine there are a lot of authors who debut authors uh debut uh to get published might be rather intimidated or scared by the bigger people saying like i'll oh, change this this and this and and all of that like how did you like Obviously, that must have been a gut and, you know, thinking that, oh, they want to change uh, some fundamental things. And this is, as you said, a like language and dialect and all of that. Like, how did you uh, how did you approach that? It's it's a nerve wracking thing because it's scary. Yeah. And, and you're this little author here. This is your your first time dealing with people that represent, in some cases, a very large organization. And you think, well, if I push back against this, are they just going to say, no, never mind? Or are they going to deem you a problematic author? Or, you know, there's any number of things that you sort of worry could happen. And the difficult thing is, at least for me, um, I knew that what I had written was very intentional. And it wasn't like, with a lot of their other comments, I could look at it and go, I see what you're saying. You know, I, I see how this could be a little bit unclear. I'll rephrase this section and make it, you know, a little bit more obvious what I'm trying to get across. But the dialect that I chose was very intentional and I knew that that wasn't something I wanted to change. So I ended up looking through that document, which had lots of commentary in it. Um, but one of the big things was dialect and word choice. And I sort of thought, how do I go back to these people who have already sort of read the book, given me pages of feedback, talked about what they want to see? How do I go back and say, mm, no, thanks, I don't want to change this? And I think that I was lucky enough with the dialect, as I mentioned, my editor uh, went and looked up some information on Gullah language and culture. And he found some videos that he watched where Gullah people were talking about how they are, you know, striving now to make this language more acceptable. Because when I grew up, if someone called you a Gichi, it was an insult. Oh. And so many people strived really hard to speak what's considered to be standardized American English. So if you would speak Geechee, it would, and someone called you a Geechee, it was this sort of, oh, you don't know how to speak correctly. So we're all trying to push back against that now. And thankfully my editor in doing his research on my book and possibly just research for his own edification, um, found some of these resources and came back to me and said, you know, I was wrong about that, and we want this book to be what you want it to be. And I thought, well, thankfully, and we did have a conversation about it and why it was important. And um, after I dealt with the editor, 
your book goes to several other people, you know, line editors and copy editors. And I also went through the same thing again when the copy editors, who are just the final people that look at your book before it goes to print, um, they had some comments on some of the word choice as well, um, some of the spelling, some of that sort of thing. And I just got to the point where I learned to use the word stet very liberally, um, which is basically a Latin word that says, let it stand. And I said what I said, and I know what <laughs> So just leave it alone. Yeah. And yeah. Um, there was one particular thing that they pointed out that I thought was, you know, sort of a, a funny moment. They wanted to change my spelling of the word barbecue from ending in Q U E to ending in C U E. And I think my response to that was more of more of the this is the reason why in South Carolina you see signs that say the letters BBQ as an abbreviation for barbecue. So I said, please do not embarrass me in these South Carolina streets by having it spelled C U E. Thank you very much. Oh. <laughs> that was a perfect response. <laughs> I, I honestly, yeah, like uh, why would they want to change so much, especially since it's a culture that they wouldn't have known about or they weren't well a part of, so they wouldn't really know. Um, so I'm so relieved that they allowed you the the space to keep what was important to your story and to the characters and who they are as people as well. Um, I, also, <laughs> I said what I said, and I'm gonna start using that all the time now, all <laughs> the time. Uh, and hi, oh my gosh, I, I saw the interview that you did with Onyx Pages a few weeks back as well, and I loved it. So yeah, I, I'm also yes, really excited. Wonderful. Yeah, right? So I'm also really excited about this. Um, yeah, a wonderful that you are empowered to have the freedom of expression of the culture. And I feel like all editors should definitely take that into consideration when they're, you know, reading or editing a book that um, has anything to do with a culture that isn't theirs to, you know, do the research and, and all of that. So I'm so glad it worked out, though. Like, I'm really glad in that it didn't put you off, you know, when you said that you were worried about, you know, they could potentially drop it. I'm so glad it didn't put you off. And you're just, yes, an inspiration. That's the short and bottom of it. Uh, so <laughs> it's, but yeah, so it was like a pretty um, up and down journey getting Root Magic published. But here it is, it's in its published form. It's out in the world. It, it's been out since January. It's out in the world, it's done. It's well, I mean, ho well, you said that you would do more, so it's not maybe technically done. But it is there and it's out. So, <laughs> uh, so can you let the, we'll talk about Root Magic now? Uh, can you let people know who might not have read it yet what Root Magic is about? Oh, absolutely. Actually, I, I have my copy here. Yay. So, um, I'm, I've gotten used to this whole sort of um, hold it up to the side of your face kind of thing, <laughs> you know, so that they can see your hold face on. and the cover at the same time. I'll tell um, you. <laughs> it is a historical Southern Gothic middle grade. And it is the story of Jez and Jay, who are 11 year old twins living in South Carolina. And they have just lost their grandmother. And she is the person who did the majority of root work and protection of the family and the property. And so now they are having to learn root work for themselves from their uncle Doc, who is a local root worker. In addition, they have to deal with uh, racism and classism, um, as well as Jez has to deal with bullies from her school. And she also has to deal with, she's at an age where she and her twin brother are starting to pursue other interests, um, different interests from each other when prior to this, they've pretty much been inseparable. So there's a lot happening. Um, and when they start learning root work, that sort of opens um, the magical world up to them. So they start learning about root work, but all the paints and spirits and creatures that live around the marsh are now noticing them for the first time as well. So it's, okay. you know, yeah, friendship yeah. and um, learning who you are, uh, learning about your history and ancestry and to embrace the person that you are. You made me want to reread it. That's like so good. That's it's like that sounds so good. I want to read it again. 
Um, it also, yes, can't wait to read it. Totally great. Out in the world. It's amazing. Um, so excited to hear. Yeah, like it is really great to hear from the actual author about experiences like with books and, and publishing. Um, yeah, so it's definitely a must. Oh, I, you know what? I want to save this question, this a viewer question. I want to save that for just a second because uh, it ties into something else, but it's a great question. Um, so how did you celebrate Root Magic when it came out in January? Because when you said before that when you got the news that it was going to be out, you kind of, you know, like, is this actually happening? It actually happened. How did you celebrate it actually happening? Well, uh, my original plan was to have a book launch party in my hometown of Charleston in South Carolina, but the pandemic happened and I was unable to do that. Uh, so I basically sat on my sofa and watched African romance movies and responded to congratulation tweets on Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> it's the next best thing. It is the it's, next best know, thing. It is the next best thing. Yeah, and, and you know what? It means that when we do have a launch party for because it's never too late, right? It's never too late it's to have one. It's never too late. It's never, it's too, never late. too late. So it can still happen. And also, you are in the UK. So if we had a root magic party in the UK, then everyone in the UK is invited. I'm, Absolutely. So I'm happy about it. <laughs> we'll throw a bash for whenever you know. Yes. The new the new stuff comes out. Exactly. We'll have a barbecue with a with a queue, not with not a, a Q -U -E. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Exactly. Uh, what was it about middle grade that drew you in then? Because as you said, like before, you were writing kind of more adult stuff. This is your debut middle grade. Um, what was it about middle grade specifically that thought that you thought this story was the best way of telling it? Well, I've. The funny thing is about that was I didn't think of it as a middle grade when I wrote it at first. It oh. wasn't until I went through the mentorship program that they said, you know, this book is sort of like floating between age groups. Do you want to make it a younger book? Do you want to make it more of an adult book? Because it was sort of hovering in this, uh, you know, nebulous space, you know, between the two. And it was basically like, have a think about it. And once you decide, you know, go fully in that direction. And I thought about it and I said, I'm bringing root work to traditional publishing, which there isn't a lot of that from the insider perspective. I'm bringing Gullah Geechee culture to traditional publishing. Um, I'm bringing the Sea Islands of South Carolina to traditional publishing, which there have been some books about it, but not a, a great deal. And I thought, I want to bring this to a younger audience because I think kids need to learn from an early age to empath you know, sympathize and empathize with characters that may not look like them, who may not be from the part of the world that they're from. And as we talked about before, you know, my love of movies and I love watching movies. Um, unfortunately, there are several Hollywood movies that sort of portray Southernness and Southern accents as an immediate, almost shorthand for this character is uneducated or undereducated or, or backwards. So it's something that I wanted to push back against and push back against that with um, hopefully readers from a younger age so that they can learn early on that people that don't look like them are not necessarily um, people to avoid. I yeah I love that um, especially since middle grade is you know for that age range a lot of impressionable kids who need those kind of lessons and I know it's like not your job as a writer to kind of teach kids but I guess that's part of being like writing in middle grade when kids do read quite young that they take certain themes or elements from the story whether it is kindness or being uh, empathetic to people who don't look like them then yeah like it, it, is that also like a little bit daunting because I mean, I, I'm, I'm guessing that you would want to write more middle grade now. Um, in the future, like, are you, like, a little, like, uh, worried about any of the, like, lessons you feel like you have to sort of give to kids? Um, I don't think that I'm necessarily worried about the lessons I have to give to kids. Um, I will have to write at least two more middle grades because I'm contracted to write two more. <gasps> um, yes. So I'm not going to have much of a choice for that. Um, Yay! <laughs> But as far as like lessons in them, I think that um, even we as adults sometimes need reminders 
of certain lessons. Um, maybe some of us didn't get those lessons when we were younger, yeah. you know, of, and it's not necessarily only the treat others as you want to be treated. It's sort of um, realizing that not everyone comes from the same background as you. And at some point you're going to interact with people that don't come from that same background and to kind of take people on a case by case basis instead of generalizing about them. And I think that's something that we can all benefit from. But as far as lessons, I think that um, kids tend to absorb more than adults sometimes think they do. And they certainly get exposed to things like bullying or people that don't like them or people that make judgments about them sometimes a lot earlier than you know parents and guardians realize so i wanted to also put that into a book um to sort of encourage kids that this is this is who you are this is your history and your family and this is a family practice and to be proud of that because a lot of times some of those negative messages that kids get come through TV shows and all sorts of things that they consume. So they need something that encourages them and encourages individuality at, I think, an earlier age than some people might realize. Oh, 100% agree, to, especially since I feel like a lot of people underestimate kids and their capacity of um, how they can re respond to the world and like their compassion and what they can can bring to certain relationships and how they interact with other people and um, especially since I do feel like a lot of kids learn from adults like in sometimes bad habits whereas like with books sometimes they can really impart a lot of wisdom that adults can't give them that are in their life so like I know my parents could never give me the, the education I truly needed um, about other people in any well anywhere in the world I love what Jess said as well about it's so important to show the language and speech patterns on indicators of intelligence I feel like that's mm -hmm. like a, a really great thing um, about a book like Root Magic um, but I'm not from the south of America or anything so I, I don't know but it's, it was definitely interesting to to read and learn and see how um, that uh, the relationships were like just like mine like in my community in the north of England it's like exactly the same just like different dialect different touches of how we like deal with things it's just we're just the same and it was like I love I love it so much um anyway sorry <laughs> we could go off on tangents <laughs> all the time um no, so when did you first get the idea of like for root magic for like root work and <laughs> yeah sorry um like root work um is something that was part of the Gulagichi um culture and how why did you um like how did root magic come to life like what was it that inspired you to make this an actual book an actual thing well i grew up with root work um i had sort of one part of my family um my uh great aunt she was a root worker um and her name was helen and her brother married another helen who was my grandmother <laughs> and um she was not into root work at all. And she was very into, you don't need to do that stuff. You need to go to school and get an education so you can get a job and support yourself. And I wanted to bring that sort of dynamic to Jez and Jay. So they have their uncle who's a root worker and then they have their mom who's just like, you just need to go to school and get an education. And that's the important part of it. And I wanted to bring that part of my experience but i also wanted to be able to incorporate a lot of the um, actual historical events that i typically don't see mentioned in a lot of books whether they're for adults or for kids um, i wanted to mention things like um, the prosecution of you know, root workers in the american south i wanted to go into because this is a you know a spoiler-free review, so I won't go into all of the <laughs> into all of the actual um, historical um, events that are in the book. But one of them is uh, school integration in South Carolina, which came nine years after the court decision um, that all schools should be integrated, and South Carolina managed to operate for nine years without following that law. So. Oh, Root so. Magic starts in 1963 when finally schools were forced to 
integrate. And a lot of, a lot of that was uh, traumatic for uh, black kids as well as white kids. And, you know, just the, the butting of heads and the, the stress and the violence and the trauma and all of that that sort of surrounded that part of the world. And I also wanted to just leave a part of my history and my background on the page. Um, my um, grandfather is from a sea island. And um, obviously, you know, my great aunt and all that family. And my mother um, did some social work on Guadalajara Island, where the book is set in 1963. So um, as far as research, there was not a lot of, you know, looking at books and doing all of that. It was just sort of remembering stories from family, talking to my mom, um, asking her questions. Yeah, that personal history. And I think that it's something that um, is, tends to be overlooked when people go, oh, well, how'd you research a topic? And not everyone thinks of, well, who can I actually have a conversation with? Who was there at the time? And I wanted to sort of embrace that sort of part of myself and, and also that sort of Gullah Geechee background of uh, incorporating ancestry and speaking with um, family members and sharing stories, because a lot of our stories didn't make it to books and novels and, and publication. So this is you know, my attempt to bring that side of the story to light. I love that, um, especially since I feel like you can feel it with the characters in how real it feels with the siblings and also with their mother. Um, I do also, uh, it was um, Eli from fifth grade also wanted to ask the same question. So Eli, we were on the same page. We we just on the same wavelength. So um, yeah, that was answered, but fantastic question, of course. Um, oh, I like this uh, question from Summer as well. Um, do you have a specific memory from your youth or like family that strongly influenced this story? Which are kind of, you, you pretty much uh, touched on that too. Um, I think so. I think one of the, um, one of the things I mentioned, I love movies and I watched a lot of them with, you know, my family growing up. And a lot of times these movies would have settings in the American South, but they wouldn't portray American Southerners in a very positive light. Um, if they incorporated hoodoo magic or root work or voodoo or any of those sort of African traditional religions, it was always portrayed negatively. And it was portrayed as this evil thing that only horrible people did to unsuspecting people. And I knew that that wasn't the magic that I grew up with. And that wasn't, you know, the intention of these um, African traditional religions. And it was just disheartening to sometimes see these movies and see these um, rituals portrayed that way. And that was the big thing that I wanted to take away. So that was a big memory that I had, but it was also part of why I wrote Root Magic. And I wanted to write it because root work isn't this, you know, big evil thing. It's was born out of protection and a need to protect ourselves and a need to heal ourselves with lots of um, herbalism and uh, using the land around us to preserve our way of life. Yeah, I, I love that. And it's now like um, forever immortalized in your book now too. And um, just this kind of uh, window into your family, your past, your culture. And I think um, a lot of people are saying as well that it's just like a very beautiful kind of uh, thing for you to, to have. Um, this question from uh, Anolia, fifth grade, do you enjoy writing books for kids? I do enjoy writing books for kids. It is, it's different than writing books for adults because I feel like I can use more fantastical, whimsical ideas. I can just dream up anything um, sometimes, depending on what you're writing for adults, you have to realize that an adult is reading this and they're going to come to it um, sometimes a bit skeptical of, well, I don't know if I really believe that, that that could happen or I don't think this is really phrased the right way. Or you always have to sort of realize that it's going to be pulled apart a little bit 
Whereas I think sometimes kids come to reading just a bit more ready to be swept up in, you know, the fantasy and the whimsy of a story. And they're just, they're ready to be enchanted. And I love that about it. Me too. I That's why I also love like children's books, middle grade. It just feels like such a, well, almost like a safe place for like us to go, like whether you're an adult or a kid, um, such as like with Root Magic, like with it being like a little bit scary as well. Like it's kind of like a safe scare because you're safe at home reading this book, but in the story, it's actually rather terrifying. I'll always remember the scene in the marshes with Jez and Jay and just how like incredible, I, I, be I believe it was a moment when Jez got stuck. I, I'm not spoiling it for anyone, but like there was a moment when Jez got stuck and I was just like, my heart was in my mouth. It was so, oh my gosh, like ha with you writing, I mean, horror beforehand, coming into children's book, um, middle grade, uh, how did you know the the balance with the horror that you brought into this book? How did you know whether you were going too far or maybe not far enough? Like, how did you how did you work the atmosphere in this? Well, I think that one of the things that um, I always keep in mind because I consider root magic to be a Southern Gothic and not necessarily mm -hmm. a fantasy, but there isn't really a huge category of Southern Gothic for kids. So I know that a lot of people reading it will sort of read it as a fantasy. Um, so I think one of the things with Southern Gothic is you're relaying the lives of these characters and it's done in a way that isn't trying to always be a, a commentary on why they do things or judging really what they do. It's really sort of revealing it, you know, for the reader to draw their own conclusions but I think it's important in a Southern Gothic to show the, the dark side of things that happen to characters, whether they are um, from dark thoughts that the character has themselves or from outside forces acting upon the characters, but also show the joy that's in those characters' lives as well. Because a lot of times we tend to forget that and we tend to forget that there are still moments and pockets of joy in people's lives. So as far as putting the darkness in there. I think that with middle grade, you have to keep the horror sort of close to the character. What is important to the character? Um, you can, for adults, go to something, you know, bigger and more cosmic and more, you know, out there. But kids, you know, you have to look at what's important to them. You know, what is something that is so close to them that they are going to feel devastated if it changes or if it's lost or if it, you know, shifts in some way. So, you know, you have to look at their ideology and their family and, and what's sort of around them that makes them feel safe and comfortable. And that's sort of the foundation that has to be shaken just a little bit in order to bring horror to kids, but still do it in a way where they have some, you know, some way of striving and recovering from that as well yeah and like getting past the the horror that they do get faced and yeah as you meant like with the family aspect of it i feel like that's a, a huge thing for jez and jay uh like if they ever lost their mum or anything like that because we do start off with and again this isn't a spoiler it's like literally i think it's written on the blurb um with the grandmother's death the start and like death and family is just such a huge huge part of it and um, so like this is like a two kind of a, a double question because um adrian from fifth grade wants to know who your favorite character in root magic is uh, but also um with that family dynamic did you draw any like you've already mentioned that your own family experiences have definitely influenced it but like with jez and jay i feel like their dynamic is just such a huge like it, it's so unique but also like very relatable do you have a sibling like is did you join your own experience like with a, a sibling or anything because jez and jay like are, are you jez like there's just like <laughs> it just it feels so real <laughs> i don't have a sibling um growing up i really really wanted a sibling um right. but my mom had two sisters and my grandmother had seven sisters and brothers wow so i tried to family sort of think of those familial relationships um, because I felt like Jez and Jay bounce off each other really well. 
because they interact well, they bring concerns to each other before they go to the adults because they realize that so much is going on, not only in their lives, but in the adults' lives. And they try really hard to solve things on their own. And I don't think that, I didn't think at the time that Jez was like me until my mom read the book. And she said, you know, Jez is a lot like you were at that age. And I went, really? And my mom is probably on this call. Hi, mom. Um, I did send her the link. So she's she's probably joined, oh, yeah, yeah. hopefully. Hi, yeah. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> uh, well, I, oh, do you have a favorite character that you wrote? As well? um, I do love writing Jez. Um, but I also loved writing Susie because she was just, she was so fun and she just had all of these mysterious things about her. And I love writing mysterious characters. And, but I wanted to give, um, I wanted to give a character who had lots to sort of play with, but she's showing Jez um, friendship. And I think sometimes, you know, interrogating friendship and seeing how friendships form and who we form friendships with is really interesting. So I think that was, those were the two characters that I enjoyed writing the most. Although I do okay. love all of them. I, yeah, I was going to say, it must be like trying to pick a child or something or a favorite cat. It like, is, it's just, yeah. There's just no, oh, oh, I quite like this question actually as well. Uh, are there any talks of the Nervin legends that inspire or scare you? Oh gosh, the South is full of superstitions and urban legends and creatures and ghosts and haints and all sorts of things. Um, I think that I do find them more inspirational than scary. Hmm. Um, when I was very young, my grandmother did tell me a boo hag story and it was the first time I had heard a boo hag story. And I think I was probably seven or eight and we were in the kitchen and uh, she told me this story about uh, how the, what the boo hag is and how it moves around and how it functions and what it does. And she told me um, what it usually says. And I remember the words to this day and I use the words in a short story that I wrote for adults um, called The Choking Kind, which is in Spook Light. Um, but she said, you know, because the Boo Hag is this Gullah Geechee creature, paranormal creature, and it is essentially a shapeshifter in some ways, um, but it can remove its skin. And um, she's telling me the story. It's like, a bright sunny day and even though and it's hot in the kitchen and even though all of those things are happening and it's warm this little chill went down my spine when she told me the story and um basically when it goes to find its skin later it says skin skin skinny do you know me and the skin is supposed to recognize its owner and so even if it's buried even if it's hidden you know when they say those words you know, it rises up, it appears. So um, that is just something that I will never forget as long as I live. And I think that was probably one of them that inspired me now, inspires me now, but probably scared me a little bit at the time. Even as an adult, just hearing it, I just, I know tonight when I go to bed, like I had some nightmares after that to go, well, you know, like not everyone like this is a fantastic book so like don't worry like the nightmares won't put you off but i did have a a dream after reading it about um certain stuff that happens in it that i don't want to spoil for anyone so i'll not say i'll i'll let you know afterwards um what the kind of dream was but uh no like there's actually more co uh, questions as well from people in the chat which i do want to get to um but firstly i do want to ask because um yeah we're talking about uh the kind of uh folklore and horror in these stories but there's actually and I feel like what this book tackles like so fantastically is that there is actual real life horror from people around us, like actual human beings. And a big um, thing that Root Magic tackles is racism. And with this being a 1960s setting, um, it was definitely interesting to see the parallels to today and like in the 2020s. Um, that's what like 
60 years i can't count it's like 60 years since like the 1960s um but like the parallels in having that in this book um what like well how did you approach um that in the book and sort of kind of how kids are reading root magic now um and how it tackles racism as well as how like did you intentionally have a sort of these are real people like officer collins he's a real person but he is doing the most horrific stuff um, so how did you approach that in, in Root Magic? Well, from stories from my family and stories that I went through and, and heard um, as a young person, um, being a Black kid in the South, you hear stories from a really early age and you're instructed from a really early age of what to be careful of and who to be careful of. And it's something that's, for the most of us, taught from a very, very young, from the moment you're, okay, we're gonna let you outside to play by yourself, but this is where you don't go. And this is what you do if this happens or come home immediately or whatever the case may be. And whether those are straightforward warnings or warnings given via stories and via folk tales, which is what a lot of Gullah folk tale focuses on is giving warnings to people um, to keep them safe and protected. There's that protection thing again. Yeah. Um, you you look at those stories that I heard growing up and you look at the news now and you find that frightening, frighteningly enough, those stories aren't all that dissimilar. So I didn't have to do a ton of work to make it relatable for a modern audience or make it um, understandable for a modern, modern audience, because unfortunately, a lot of those things are still happening now. Um, it was just a matter of creating the 1963 setting and looking at some of the stories that I'd heard growing up of um, root workers who took it upon themselves to uh, educate communities, make medicines for communities that were um, really in many ways cut off from um, going to hospitals or getting medications. And a lot of times this was, these were the only medications that people really had access to, things that were homemade tinctures or things that root workers created from herbs and uh, roots and fruits and things like that. Um, but because of that, that was part of the reason that they were prosecuted because a lot of times um, part of that prosecution was taking root workers off to jail for practicing medicine without a license. And it was really this sort of push-pull between do we make our own medicines and take the chance of going to jail for it, or do we let our communities you know, get sick and, and die? And it was like this, where do we go? What do we do? And it was... Um, protecting yourselves, being uh, insular, secluding yourselves, and knowing that when someone did come to your area, to your island, to your community, to be aware and to, you know, look out for each other. So a lot of this um, portrayal isn't really all that different. And in talking with my mom and my grandma and uncles and cousins and things like that, talking about experiences that they've had where you couldn't go to report it to police because it was something that was said, well, they're just being kids or they're just, you know, acting out, you know, don't worry about it, you know, and it was not really, um, those people weren't given the opportunity to have justice for these things. And whether it was something large, like someone um, being killed, or whether it was something small, like someone dehumanizing you in a way of spitting on you or throwing things at you or whatever have you, you didn't have recourse to bring that person to um, the perpetrator to justice. So there wasn't a lot of change, unfortunately. And hopefully people writing more about it and sharing stories of things that authentically actually happened um, 
whether they're partially partially fictionalized like root magic or whether they are um, non-fiction books um, hopefully that does mean that in the next 60 years we will see a significant change yeah, I mean, humans can definitely be scarier than Haynes and Buhags, and I feel like a great, we spoke about this before as well, about how middle grade and children's book can uh, teach compassion and kindness. So, you know, the generation that are reading Root Magic now will have the tools now to, you know, if they read books like Root Magic, um, will have the tools now to be educated on themselves on how to treat other people and like how they shouldn't act especially with like all of the racism and root magic and how the family are so bonded together and how strong they are in protecting themselves um from that and honestly like some of that like my skin would crawl more with the police in root magic than any of the more like supernatural elements of it and i hope like i really hope that kids reading it now will also feel the same way like this isn't like, you know this is very um how they're being treated is uncomfortable and it shouldn't happen so that's what that's what i'm hoping for as well so is that the kind of thing that you would want root magic to be able to do um for kids who are reading it like this is kind of inspiring the next generation Oh, absolutely. And um, I don't think this is a spoiler to say this, but there is a portion of the book where um, Mama does say, you know, she talks about um, dealing with uh, the racism and what happens uh, to the family. And she does say, I'd rather deal with the Haynes. Mm. And it is very much a mindset of, you know, one of the edits that I got in going through root magic was, um, well, aren't these people scared when they're uh, confronted with the supernatural? You don't show them being afraid in these encounters that they're having with supernatural entities. And a lot of times that's something that I have to push back on in my own work because um, even in speaking with my own grandmother, we used to watch those black and white camera horror movies um, together, and I, I would ask her, I said, well, aren't you scared, you know, vampires and werewolves and all this other sort of stuff, and she said, no, I'm a fictional character, these are, you know, movies, they're not real, she said, I'm more afraid of other human beings, and so in Root Magic, you'll see them deal with the supernatural differently than they deal with, um, other forces and i think that's very um very true to a lot of uh traditional Galagichi people yeah yeah uh, honestly there's, there's like so much in root magic that i feel like the themes theme wise they all just really interconnect and um, whether it is to do with the, the human beings of the of the book to the most supernatural elements of it. I honestly, like, I cannot recommend this enough to people who are watching who have not yet read it, but I have seen that some people have bought it as well. Uh, like Danny, um, goes and buys of another book. Yeah, you should, you Thank should you, buy. <laughs> <laughs> um, and Ellie already loves it and hasn't even read it yet. So that's awesome. That's exactly what we wanted. Um, a couple more questions from the school. I think um, Miss uh, Chappelle has a class um, who have like, a few questions. Like there's a, a couple more if that's okay. Um, how did you choose the names, uh, Jay and Jezebel, but also how did you choose the title, Root Magic, um, from Xavier and Lyra? Um, I think J, which is short for James. Um, James is my grandfather's name, who was born on uh, one of the sea islands off of South Carolina. And unfortunately, he passed away the year before I was born. So I just wanted to, you know, just honor that memory of him and the stories that I got of him, even though I didn't have a personal relationship with him. Um, and I chose Jezebel because there is a root that's used in root work that's called Jezebel root. And I wanted to um, just honor that history of root working and, and hoodoo. Nice. Oh, and the story and the title root magic. Um, Root Magic was not the original title of the book. And um, there was another title that I submitted the book under. And in going through edits, we looked at that original title and, you know, um, the editors thought, well, we need something 
shorter and punchier that just is more of a overarching commentary on what's included in the story. And the story is about root magic and root working and how it affects this one particular family and community. So we decided to change it to root magic from its original title. Can you say the original title? Or are you still like planning to use it at some point or? Um, I would probably like to use it at some point, but it's out there sort of floating around on the internet. Um, so you can probably find it. Absolutely, I'll be looking that up. Uh, but also like with root <laughs> magic is <laughs> also with like root magic and so like yeah, like the roots of family and it just like it's it's the perfect embodiment of the entire book. I, I love that that title. It's just so magical just when you read it as well. Like, oh it's just it's it's a perfect title. And then the last question I think from that class is where can we send fan art where you've been drawn pictures of scenes from the book after each chapter and we would like to share oh, it? Oh my gosh. Oh, that's amazing. I'd love um, to say I'm, that too. <laughs> I am on Twitter. Um, if you're comfortable sharing those things on Twitter, I'm at Eden Royce on Twitter. Uh, it's linked in my description. Link I'm also description. on Instagram, which I'm still sort of learning to navigate. I took my you know first screenshot with my phone recently. I'm touching <laughs> onto. Um, so I'm on Instagram as well at Eden Royce Books. So either one of those places. Uh, you can send those to me. I will do my best to retweet slash share slash reblog, repost. I don't know what it's called <laughs> on Instagram. Um, so, yes, please. I'd love to see it. Yeah, that's awesome. I also think it would be, because there's so many scenes I would love to see, like, visualize. Actually, there was a question, like, very early on. Oh, here it is from the same one, um, Anelia. Would you ever turn the story into a movie? I mean, honestly, like, that's, like, something that is very far beyond um as an author i know that it can be quite a a hard process for that but i i can imagine you would love this to be movie. I would. so yeah going on from that would you want it animated live action like what's the how do you oh, envision wow. it um i would love to have it um i sort of honestly i would love to have it as a film or a tv show um mm. but i guess in my mind i would love to have it as a television show Ooh. Because I think you would get more time with the characters and more time to show nuances and things like that and more of the culture and more of the community. Um, this is sort of a quick side note. I don't know if I mentioned this already, but Root Magic has an educational guide um, that's separate. And it is um, partially written by me. There's um, uh, a letter from me in it. Um, a wonderful uh, teacher and librarian wrote the majority of the exercises and things like that. Uh, the wonderful Sarah Makiba Days, who's a Gullah Geechee historian and archivist, um, wrote an article about Gullah Geechee people um, as well. So um, I can send you that link, but it's on the um, publisher website, Walden Pond Press's website as a link. Um, but I think that it would be amazing to see more of the community as well and i think a tv show sort of lends itself a little bit better to spending more time with the characters um as far as animated versus live action i i would be open to either to be honest i think that um with everything that they're able to do with cgi now there's you know hybrids of live action and um animated as well so I think that with either animated or CGI, you can do more with the supernatural aspects, you know, of the book. Yeah. But honestly, if they said, hey, we'd like to do a live action uh, TV show of it, I'm not going to say no. No, definitely not. Definitely <laughs> not. <laughs> I hope that you, the first thing you would do, I mean, I can imagine you'd have to keep it quiet for a while, but I hope the first thing you do as soon as you can is let everyone know because that would just be incredible too. I'd love to, yeah, to see the story develop, the characters develop, and there's so many more, again, like the culture is so rich with the Gulagichi, like it's so rich, it's so vast, you could do so much with it in a TV show. It would just be incredible to be able to have the the medium to explore it all yeah films might be a bit too short and maybe not give it the nuance it needs um so i totally agree with that 
Um, so the last couple of questions then, um, well, one of them is like, do you know of any international releases? And I know that it's been a bit of a hard, uh, you've talked about it's been like quite a hard one because in the UK, um, it has been released in the UK probably, which is why we are doing uh, a giveaway for two lucky UK viewers, which again, Eden was so kind enough to to uh, do. And um, they're on their way to me, so I will send them off. I will pick two winners from the live chat, which I have access to. Um, everybody who has left the emoji and their social media handle, I will pick two winners and I'll let you guys know in the next couple of days. And yeah, that'll, that's gonna be awesome. But is there any like other news about any releases? I haven't heard share? any um, that I know of. Um, I've been sort of nudging and asking. I did let them know that I was doing this interview tonight. Um, wink, wink. <laughs> wink, wink, nudge, nudge. Um, so hopefully that will happen and that will at least, if the wheels aren't already turning, that will get wheels turning. Um, I have already turned in my second middle grade book to the editor. It isn't root magic, it's uh, a contemporary, but Ooh. still with um, a Southern setting, still with magic and all that stuff, but um, more of a contemporary setting. Um, so fingers crossed if root magic makes the journey across the ponds that the same will happen with the second middle grade whenever that comes out. So. I'm, oh, that's, that's that was actually, yeah, that was actually going to be my last question. Like, what are you working on? But that just, that's something like, I'm so excited to see what more, like, would you incorporate more, like you said, it's contemporary and has a little bit more, um, a little bit supernatural. Is there like, well, I obviously can't tell me everything, but are you incorporating more of like the Southern Gothic that you're like so great at writing? Is that, is that still happening in it? I love Southern Gothic and, yeah. um, I wrote it as a Southern Gothic. Um, obviously, it still will have to go through edits or whatever have you, um, but that's already written. Um, as far as what I'm writing now, um, I wrote, uh, I'm writing, I should say, a Southern Gothic YA um, right now. And hopefully I'll be able to get that finished by the end of the summer, I would think. And while I'm sort of waiting for um, edits back on this middle grade, I've sent them um, some sketches and ideas for third middle grade. And uh, I've sent all that in and I'm waiting for response. And so I've decided to focus on writing something for the adult market again <laughs> while oh, nice. I wait to hear back from YA slash middle grade. So I'm trying to keep busy, but um, I do want to hear back and I do want to know what they think about it. and. I'm ready for, you know, to work on it again. It sounds like we've got a lot to look forward to in the future. Um, I quickly asked this question from Emma. Are there any other books you would recommend to kids? Like, is there anything you've read recently that you've loved or? Oh gosh, so much. Um, I would recommend um, Hoodoo by Ron Smith. Um, Tracy Batiste's Jumbie series is forever a favorite. Um, I would say Karen Strong's Just South of Home is wonderful. Oh, I see you've got those. Yes. <laughs> this one's just come out in paperback as well in the UK. And I was like, yes, yes, I, I needed it. I can't wait to read it. But Oh, totally speaking enjoyed. of paperback, I should tell you, I just found out that yeah. Root Magic will be getting a paperback. <sighs> um, I've seen sort of a first run through of what they're doing with the paperback. Um, it might not be the final, but um, yay, it's getting a paperback. Um, but yeah, I, I think if you like Southern settings and mysteries, also, um, Karen Strong's Just South of Home is wonderful as well. So there's lots, lots out there to read, um, for kids that are interested in mysteries and slight spookiness and all that good stuff. Nice, nice, and uh, yeah, I can't, even though I already own the hardback of Root Magic, I'll still get the paperback 
Uh, I just want it in every format that's possible. Um, and yeah, I will also link the educator's guide in the description box. I have all of Eden Rice's social media, website, everything in the description box. So do give Eden Rice a follow. Um, but yeah, uh, I will let you guys know who the giveaway winners are in the next couple of days. I'll announce that on Twitter and Instagram. And also, I guess with this being on YouTube, I will do it in the community tab on YouTube too, uh, just in case anybody doesn't have it, even though, you know, social media, social media handles I've asked for. So obviously I'll have to get, uh, just ignore me. I'll announce winners. <laughs> Trying to wiggle, wiggle through in my head there, but no, it's it's fine. All you guys will have social media. That's good. Um, but yeah, anyway, that was the interview. Thank you so much, Eden, for joining me on this fine Friday night, even with all the stuff you're doing and how busy you are. Like, thank you so much for joining me. I hope you enjoyed it. I did. Thank you so much for having me on the show. Oh my I gosh. I'm absolutely thrilled by it. And thrilled by the response and you know just the love that root magic has been shown thank you all so so much and again it's not the end of root magic or anything there's still going to be more like you know love being shown to it we're going to get on the publishers to release it worldwide and for the sequels i would love that um so yeah we are gonna be um heading off now but thank you so much everyone for tuning in uh and yeah thanks everyone bye <laughs>